Welcome to Tam Tara's first ever head to toe, start to finish, all beds included garden tour. I actually owed you guys this video or was planning on releasing this video for July 1st, but if you haven't heard yet, Canada got some record-breaking high temperatures and there was simply no way in heck I was going to be out here in 45 degree weather filming a garden tour for you. It was the best I could do to keep the garden alive for a week of 45 degrees Celsius. Um, it does not ever usually get that hot here. That is not normal for us. I have, I don't think, ever lived through 45 degrees Celsius before in my long 26 years of life. Having a 45 degree Celsius week really did kind of throw off the garden. I feel like it just paused everything. The plants didn't necessarily die because I rotated some big cotton sheets over top of them all. I did a lot of heavy watering in the evenings and did my best to keep them alive and cool-ish. But they definitely didn't pop into that third week after transplanting growth spurt that I was expecting. I didn't want to miss the opportunity to share my early July garden tour with you, so we're going to do this first, and I'll release an update video on Tam Tara's growth in general later on. We have three in-ground perennial garden beds that look a little wild and untamed right now because they are. We are redoing the rock walls that define the beds which means we haven't planted a lot on them this year because we have to be able to add dirt move dirt and support and mortar in the rocks and when i say wild i mean wild this is one of them and you cannot tell that it is a garden bed this bottom row here is going to be the asparagus bed that's the goal we're also going to interplant it with some other things but we have to get the rock wall and the dirt in there all of it mortared in and set us up for success for years to come with a perennial bed that's established and easy to maintain. Right now, it's a little bit of a gopher hotel, which would be a problem if we tried to put anything in there, so it's unplanted, unkept. In this middle garden bed where these four big posts are is our raspberry patch. We extended it this year. We did a lot of thinning out of some of the old wood that wasn't producing. We have these four large posts that are going in to create the trellis. We still, like I said, have to get the rocks in and the mortar, everything secure, and the extra topsoil, gardening soil, potting soil, compost, groundness in there before we level out the posts and then wire them in order to hold up the raspberry bushes. The beautiful thing about raspberry bushes is that they will just simply grow whether they are trellised or not. So I'm not worried about us getting less of a harvest or not being able to reap the benefits of this fruit at all. I'll take you in there so you can see how fully loaded these raspberry canes are with fruit. Raspberry jam is the first preserve I ever made. It was really the first thing that I ever canned. Always had a great appreciation for this raspberry patch. I'm happy that we're taking the time this year to set it up with a proper bed, put some new soil in there, and really set up a good trellising system so that these plants aren't falling over into the path. It will then be able to be better maintained with the lawnmower and look a little less crazy. We also transplanted our red currant bush into this perennial row this spring. It has produced so many red currants this season. We just haven't harvested them or gotten around to protecting this bush from the birds. Next year, I'll be a little bit more proactive, throw some protective netting over there. But for now, we've had other priorities. These beds have been really left to nature's own devices. The robins have really appreciated this red currant bush, and I'm not really upset about allowing them to enjoy this lovely bush for one season before I get a little bit more intentional about keeping it safe from them. Red currant flavor is so hard to explain. Other than being slightly tart, it just tastes like a red berry. This is the area of the perennial berry bed that's going to be reserved for the blueberries. I've got three or four different varieties in mind, but again, waiting on the rocks and the soil amendments before we get those perennials roots in their ground and get them established for the years to come. At the end of this row is where we're going to be putting our rhubarb, which again, a perennial. And once we get these set up, the maintenance will be very minimal. 
Now, the last row out of these three in-ground perennial beds is definitely the most kept because it's the one that we haven't taken the dry stack rock wall down yet. Because we have things that we don't want to get damaged that are in this bed. We have all of these beautiful lilies. There is a plum tree, some Shasta daisies down there at the end, as well as a bunch of strawberries. In the spring, mom was on her hands and knees in this bed, taking out as many strawberries as she could. Before this spring, this whole thing was pretty much overgrown with strawberries. They're ever bearing. They're a great variety. I unfortunately don't know the name of it. We haven't actually gotten a harvest of strawberries from these plants for probably two years because these areas are so wild. There are gophers and birds and other little creatures that have really been enjoying the berry harvest. Next season we're going to get the rest of the strawberries out of this bed and put them in front of our deck by the house. It's a lot closer to us and the dogs and we'll be under a little less pressure from all of the rodents and the pests. This area again is extremely wild and I didn't really want to invest too much heart or soul into the crop I was expecting out of this bed because it's hard to protect it from things like gophers or bunnies. I started both varieties of chamomile this year, the Roman and the German. This is the German perennial and that's why I put it in this bed. I just wanted to be able to guarantee myself chamomile years to come. I also just think it's beautiful. Of course, it attracts pollinators and it's just a cute plant for me. Other than chamomile, we have four or five baby Brussels sprouts plants. I was very surprised that these even germinated. I started them right in the ground out here with some pretty hot compost. I'm impressed they lasted. They're about this big and have been pretty ravaged by caterpillars and slugs. We do have this plum tree that has managed to hang on throughout the years. And I think last season was the first time that it produced one single plum. It has not been treated for bugs. It has not really been cared for in the way that you do for fruit trees because I have no idea how to care for them. But it's still standing. It's alive and it's been watered this year more than I think it has been in the years prior. So one day soon we will do some research on plum trees and figure out how to better take care of that guy. Now that we covered the three wild perennial beds, we're going to get into some of the more cultivated and curated garden beds that have actual food production happening in them. One of them will be, still kind of wild looking, my little teepee area. Now, last year I grew zucchinis in this little round thing because I didn't know if bunnies were gonna be able to get in there and destroy everything. I was really lucky last year and bunnies completely avoided this weird little circle I cut out of the ground. This year we'll see how we do because I built a teepee and I'm growing my pole beans here. First of all, I'm pretty proud that this is still upright. Shout out to my mom for helping me, but I did all the little wrapping things there. Very exciting for me. Second of all, there's a pumpkin in the center of it. I don't know if those things grow good together or not, but this year is the year of A-B testing. So I've got pumpkins planted in a few places and I'm just gonna see where they like to grow the most here. That being said, it is a fairy tale pumpkin. They are obviously gorgeous, but really, really good for cooking. That's why I chose them. I'm really excited to make some kind of pumpkin gnocchi, different types of soups, pumpkin puree, freeze it all. I have been Pinteresting the crap out of pumpkin recipes because I've planted three of these bad boys and I'm excited. There is a little bit of pest damage. I don't know what's eating them, but I'll show you. I'm thinking maybe earwigs because earwigs have a tendency to leave the veins of the leaf, but eat out in between, kind of leaving like a skeleton on the leaf, but they're happy, their roots are in, and now they're starting to grow up this little teepee. I've also sprinkled in a bunch of baby's breath seeds just along this outside of this circle. Go away, sunshine. I'm sick of you. Welcome to our first raised bed. This bad boy is basically the root vegetable bed. The reason I planted all of my root crops in one bed instead of spreading them out, which is what I would normally do, was because this soil was set up and ready to go as soon as the snow melted. I didn't have to make any soil amendments, which meant all of my cold hardy stuff, which is all of my root vegetables, could go in the ground sooner if I was okay with just putting them in this bed, which is what I did. I tend to align with more of the permaculture approach to things, uh, as well as intercropping and having different 
sections of my garden dedicated to the same crop. So having beets in three or four areas or salad greens in three or four areas so that the pest pressure would hypothetically be less. And if one area fell prey to a specific type of fungus or moth or a bunny rabbit, then the other area of the same crop would still be salvageable and I could potentially save it from the same grim fate. There, see? This is already bigger. Right here is already bigger than all of my beets last year ever got. Progress, not perfection. <laughs> I have three beet varieties. The red guys back here are bull's blood. And then with the green leaves here in the middle are Detroit reds. And then we've got the cylindra, the long skinny slicer beets here in the front. Here are a few of the Detroit reds that are starting to bulb up. Very exciting for me. This whole bed too is loaded up with mushrooms. Not really sure why, but to me that just means that I've got healthy, nutrient-rich soil, so I'm gonna go with it. After that, we've got our carrots. <gasps> what is that? Oh my goodness, what are you? Obviously a larva of some type. It is dry and empty, just hanging on to my carrots. Creepy. Let me know in the comments below if you know what this is. Thank you. <laughs> All right, as well as it being my first year growing pretty much everything, it's my first year growing rutabagas. I planted so many rutabagas back here. Look at how well they're doing. Look at that rutabaga. But I am very proud and impressed of this little bed here. So we've got the beet rose, we've got the carrots, the rutabagas, and this guy right here is the sage that somehow managed to overwinter here. Now, Sage is not a perennial at our, at our elevation or in our zone, but look how good it's doing. I have a massive chamomile plant here at the front. This is the Roman chamomile, so it is an annual. It will apparently produce a lot more flowers than the German, which is the perennial variety you saw in the other bed. To finish this bed off, I've got a bunch of leeks. Again, I have never grown leeks before, but Charles Dowding said that you can grow them in clusters of three, and the way that leeks grow, they'll kind of push out from each other and not actually impede the growth. So this is my little test to see how they do. They're starting to get pretty thick at the bottom there, as you can see, so I'm excited to roast these up with some olive oil, parmesan, and garlic. It will be a very good harvest day. I know that there's like specific timings to get right with garlic. I just have a lot of it that volunteers in my raised beds from previous years, and I have never harvested at the right time to be able to use any of it. So that is what I believe is growing all along this little row here. Some of them is doing good. Some of them is making scapes. Some of them is dead. That's the way, she do That's the way it goes over here, okay? <laughs> Some of it works out. You have to really want to live in this neck of the woods. This bed is kind of where I have been planting all of the things that I didn't have anywhere else to put. So at the back, we've got four spaghetti squash plants. I am going to trellis them up this fence over these little trusses and potentially in and through the potato bed that's in the back there. In front of the spaghetti squashes, we have a lot of volunteer potatoes that I just didn't take out of the ground from last year, apparently. They're producing. I'm not going to kill them. I'm going to eat them. We've also got this lovely little nasturtium, which I harvested a few of the flowers for. And then we've got some calendula coming up here in the front. And I believe I see a few echinacea plants over there on that edge. So right next to this volunteer potato area, I've got a bunch of more rutabaga seeds. They seemed to do really well on this side of the property, so I figured I'll throw a few more in the ground and see if I can figure out what to cook with them. Now I'm not going to get into it too much because there's going to be an entire no dig potato bed video coming. I will do the harvest. I will show you the varieties I've planted. I will show you the beginning of this no dig potato bed. If you are interested in seeing that, and I am so excited to do that potato harvest. If you want to be there with me while I freak out about discovering how these potatoes did, hit that subscribe button so you can follow along. This is probably the area of the garden that I am literally the most excited about. I have some serious love for potatoes and I am so 
excited to see how this crop does. I've got like seven varieties in there and I'm gonna give you a sneak peek now, but make sure you hit that subscribe button so you can see the whole harvest video as well as how I started this no dig bed and my tips, my tricks, and more, more importantly and more likely my mistakes. So this is the potato patch. Look how happy they are. It's, just, it's working. They're growing. Oh, love it when it works. Anyway, that has now kind of finished this whole area of the yard. And now I'm going to take you to the raised garden beds that we did a lot of soil amendments on. This lovely greenhouse behind me has been in so many of my YouTube videos. However, it's still not done. I have not painted the interior and the exterior is not finished. But this spring I did manage to attach a few trellises to the front of it so that we can use the space. Moving on to the three raised beds closest to the house, and I guess you could call them our kind of market gardens. Not that we produce food for markets in them, but that it is where we're going to get most of our produce from. My experience growing cucumbers last year was so bad that no one even knew that I tried to grow cucumbers. I just didn't talk about it. The slugs destroyed them. They never got more than two leaves at a time. End of my cucumber experience. This year, this year, honey, we are looking good. I'll be honest, there is a lot going on in this bed. It looks so full and lush that I'm really excited. But I will say, I've got a lot of big leaves here and there's some potential for good old powdery mildew to show up. Knock on wood, it's not been a problem yet, but it is still very early in my season, so we'll see if that's an issue that we have to overcome later. In the front, we've got one, two, three, four uh, black beauty zucchinis or courgettes, whichever you call them, summer squash. There is already a few that are taking form in there. We are very excited to get our zucchini on this year. I started all of these plants from scratch on the grow station I showed you guys me building in the winter here. I'm so proud because they don't have any kind of powdery mildew and they took off. This whole bed was very happy during the whole 45 degree week. I have no idea why they did so well in that level of heat. They didn't even wilt when they were full sun all day long. So. I am super impressed with how well this bed is doing. In the back here, we have a few cucumber plants that are trellised to go up the face of the greenhouse. Closest to the left side of the greenhouse, we have the Suyo Long Cucumber. This is an Asian cucumber. It's kind of spiky and it's really long and thin. I'm really excited for this one just for fresh eating and because it apparently handles really, really hot temperatures well. And after the week that we just had, I can attest that it seems to really like them. So here's hoping that it does well for the rest of this Okanagan summer. In the center of this garden bed, I went for a little pretty arrangement. We have another annual chamomile plant. I have a lot of chamomile. I like it. I'm excited for it. So we've got another little annual Roman chamomile plant surrounded by three lovely cosmoses. Cosmoses? Cosmos? Now back here behind the cosmos, we have some Malbar spinach. There's actually four, five. Oh, we got another one. There's five little starts coming up. This is a spinach type plant. It is extremely heat tolerant. And this is my first year even hearing of it. I wanted to see if it grew well here so that I could potentially use it as a shade in future years to come to trellis over garden spaces and protect the plants growing underneath it from the 40 degree and direct sun that we often get on these beds. So I've decided to cap the ends of these beds with calendula, marigolds, and peppers on that side. Now this is the front of that garden bed and this gets a lot of sun. That's why I've got these two King of the North pepper plants here. They're actually producing flowers already and they are looking really happy, to be honest. Last year, I basically didn't grow flowers successfully at all. This year, I have done my darndest to try to incorporate them in every raised bed, in all the nooks and crannies, and calendula and marigolds are by far my favorites to have around. Onto the second bed, we built a serious trellis. So we decided to do this kind of curved panel where it meets in the center here, and then goes back out to 
the T posts on the four corners. And knowing that our trellis is ridiculously over secure makes me really happy. <laughs> now for the vegetables in this bed. So in a few of my other videos, I've talked about the varieties of tomatoes that we're growing, but here, which is basically the back of this garden bed, these tomato plants would get the least amount of sun because they would be blocked by the other tomato plants. That's why I planted our indeterminate varieties called early girls at the back of this bed so that they would have the opportunity to grow up taller on the trellis and get the sunshine that the other varieties might have been blocking them from. So I've got four early girl tomato plants on this stretch of this panel and one on the far corner of the panel as well. And then I have six Manitoba tomatoes. They're a determinant variety. I have a larger amount of the Manitobas than the other two because they're the ones that I'm looking at potentially preserving if we have a good harvest off of them because they will produce all at the same time. So I'm hoping that they are successful this year. As for the type of tomato itself, it's just a general good all-around tomato. It's not a paste. It's not a massive beefsteak. It's just a good classic tomato. I don't know if they have a word for that category, but it's about this big and it's red. I'm excited. So I have the most of the Manitoba because they're bred and designed to be able to put up with a short and intense grow season. That is what they have in Manitoba. So hopefully it does good for us here. Because our tomatoes are essentially growing in the shape of an X in a square, we have these triangles of empty space. So, of course, I filled them up with some flowers and snuck in, today actually, I snuck in our second round of root vegetables. So I planted some cylindra beets, some bull's blood beets, some dwarf carrots, as well as the celery that mom had been growing on the kitchen counter from clippings from the grocery store. So these are the little celery plants that I just put in the ground today. This one has been going from like January on our kitchen counter. And then there's another little guy there. We also have a Roman chamomile plant. For whatever reason, these are our tiny Tims and the entire plant is tiny. So I don't know if they just kind of dwarfed and this is the size that they're going to be, but they are a third of the size of the other tomato plants. I'm hoping they start to stretch out. I am going to let one of them start producing flowers and see if it's happy and continues to do so or to see if I should maybe interfere. Now in the front of this garden bed by our little white picketed fence, I've got all of the other peppers that I've planted this year. These are all the King of the North variety. They are a red bell pepper. They look very happy and healthy despite having a lot of sunshine the last couple days. In this empty center area of this triangle, I have planted some Thai basil as well as bull's blood beets. And I just put those in the ground today. I'm hoping that it's not too hot and I can keep it moist enough that they'll germinate. This bed is very full, and it is full of a bunch of random stuff, so let's get into it. I was told it does not germinate easily. Well, mine completely germinated very easily to the point where I have a plethora of corn. <laughs> but um, I've also not seen corn grown in raised beds. I know that it's a heavy feeder. I just put a bunch of new compost and set these beds up for success this year. So I'm hoping that I'm not going to shoot myself in the foot by having corn in a raised bed. But I know I am going to be getting a very good harvest of corn this year. I chose this bed because it's the furthest away from the greenhouse. And at the time, I thought it got the most sun. Turns out the bed in the middle gets the most sun because this, this bed gets shaded from our house a little bit. The intention of planting the corn in the middle of the bed as opposed to in a row on the edge, for example, was that I would be able to plant around the corn and use it as a natural shade and heat cover for the rest of the plants in the bed. And I'm excited because I think it's working. Beside the corn, hiding in the shadows, would be Orac and Swiss chard. So here we have the Orac. It is starting to bolt now, but I've been able to come through here and harvest it the last week and a bit and really stretch out it going to seed really quickly because it's planted so closely to this corn. It gets the shade come afternoon. As well as this Swiss chard, it's not bolted at all. It's rainbow Swiss chard. I just thinned it the other day. 
It's got some slug damage happening, but I don't mind sharing with slugs a little bit. I want greens throughout the summer, so if I can find cool little tricks like planting it in and amongst corn in order to stretch out how long I have greens available to me, I'm gonna do it. This is all of my kale that has gone to seed. <laughs> there is red kale and blue kale here. Um, all of this kale surprisingly overwintered, so I didn't put this in the ground this year at all. I was able to harvest some leaves off of these plants early in the spring and eat them. But now, as you can tell, it has flowered and gone to seed. My theory is that if I just keep planting kale in this area, I'm going to be able to keep harvesting it. And because I bought these starts last year from a store, I don't have these seeds. So I was going to let these seed pods do their thing so that I could hopefully harvest the seeds and just replant these for a fall harvest. I like it. It looks really kind of prehistoric. The flowers were really pretty yellow and they attracted a lot of bees. And now hopefully I'm going to be able to save some seeds off of it. Now on the other side of this bed, I've got another little nasturtium here, dwarf jewel variety. This one's orange, super gorgeous. Um, this is that other kale plant that's behind this nasturtium here. And then we get into our wax bush beans. These are the bush variety, obviously, so they don't need to be in a trellis. I just have them held up by tomato cages. They're doing really well. Uh, this variety is yellow. They're bush beans determinant, so they're going to be the ones that I hopefully preserve. I think in the long run, I like the classic green bean, so I'm going to look at getting a bush variety that produces a green bean so that I can preserve green beans, because I think they'll look more appetizing if they've been canned. If they're dark green, then an off yellow. But maybe that won't matter. I'm sure they're gonna taste great. And apparently beans freeze really well, as, so that's an option too if you don't wanna can them. But my little row of beans here are doing very, very well. I think there's about 13 plants. They like being right next to the corn. Rumor has it that corn and beans do really well together, so I know it's not a pole bean, so it's not gonna climb up the corn but I figured that the soil dynamics would do well. Fixing nitrogen and corn being a heavy eater, so here's hoping they like being bed buddies. We do have some other things happening here at the front. We've got this massive nasturtium plant. I've got these little pepper plants that my friend Keegan gave me. Uh, we don't know what they are. They are some type of like seasoning pepper, so like a cayenne or something that you blend up to make spice out of. They came out of his packet of salsa blend, apparently. So I don't know if they're really hot. I don't like spicy things. My brother does. So my idea was if I don't like them or if they're too hot for me or they're, I'm too scared to try them, basically, that I'll, I'll bring in the big brother. I'll make him eat them. <laughs> We've got this levage stuff in here. It's kind of hard to see. It's behind the peppers, but in front of the corn. Apparently it's some type of celery. Mom brought it back from somewhere and we planted it right here. I think it's getting a little squished in here from the beans and then the peppers and now all this corn that's growing. And it's getting to the point where some of these I think we can actually harvest and eat them. So maybe a good haircut will help it. All right, we're getting close to the end of the tour. I've got a lot of garden beds and I talk a lot about all of them. So hopefully you're still here. This whole garden bed is new this year. I built it, I think, in March. It was really muddy when I built this. Horrible time building it. This year, as you can tell, it is full to the brim with five winter butternut squash plants. The intention is to grow them up and over the trellis and then over the propane tank, hiding the propane tank and making it prettier over here while also giving them lots of air and space and room to wander while not being on the ground so I can hopefully avoid some mold and mildew problems. The wood we built it with is really nice and it made this whole corner look way cleaner and way more finished so I'm super excited that it's in. It also like tripled our amount of growing space here because before it was only about a foot and a half wide. Now it is at least four feet. So at the back, like I said, we've got our winter butternut squash, we've got a cosmos, marigold, and we have some strawberries that we just transplanted from the perennial beds. This blank space used to have a bunch of random onions, now they died, so I planted in there some leeks. 
Leeks are really cold hardy. While it's getting pretty late in the season to be planting them, maybe I can protect them and harvest them out of a couple feet of snow if I have to. So I put in leeks there today, watered them in. Hopefully it's warm enough and they like getting germinated in the middle of the summer. We'll see how it goes. Fingers crossed. We also have little clusters of sweet peas growing. There's some cosmos and marigold on the end. In that back corner, underneath the leaves of this guy, there is, I have to figure out how to let you have some space. There we go. A butterfly bush coming in. We have now covered all of the food producing garden beds. Head up into the shade and take a look at some of our herb beds. So we grow both culinary herbs as well as medicinal herbs. A lot of these I started indoors a few months ago. Some of them I direct sowed. Some of them are perennials, like this massive valerian plant. It's huge. And it looks rather prehistoric, if you ask me. This year, it is the year of A-B testing. This valerian plant is right in the smack down center of this whole bed. It's a really long bed. And that tree right there is a really big old pine tree. What that means basically is anything that's underneath that pine tree is really acidic. The soil on that side stays pretty dry because it's blocked by the tree. It drops its leaves and its pine cones right into this bed. And the soil over here is noticeably different than the soil on this side of the bed. So what I did basically was mirrored this whole layout for these herbs on the left side and the right side of the bed. That way with the perennial and the annual herbs that I'm trying to grow, I can establish which side of the bed they would like to be on for the rest of their lives. I know I could look up the pH and I could figure out what plants like acidic soil or companion planting guides and I know that that information is out there but I think that there is something really important about the experience of trying it out yourself. Knowledge that you have earned and lived through and experienced sticks with you and means something different than knowledge that you've just read on a website or out of a book. So here at the back we've got some sage plants We've got one catnip plant. I actually only, this is the only plant I just planted one of because, to be honest, it's a perennial. I don't use catnip a lot. I don't know a lot about it. I have more seeds if I decide I need more of it. But for now, I just put it over here. It's growing quite well. It has some damage from pests, but nothing too bad so far. I also have some cilantro growing on this side. A big difference is that this stuff has not bolted while the cilantro on the other side of the bed has. My little rosemaries here in the front are just that, very little and tiny. I put them in the ground about two weeks ago. They were about the same size. I've not seen a lot of growth, except for maybe on these guys, but it's still early. I can't quite tell if they're happy or not. We've got the curly leafed parsley here. Again, all of this stuff is still very baby. I just planted it out not too long ago. I have a butterfly bush in this corner as well. So I believe this is hyssop. Yes. Hyssop is a perennial bush. And then I've got bergamot back there as well. Wild bergamot to be specific. Both doing quite well on this side of the bed. I have my opal basil and it is looking worse for wear. These guys got transplanted out and then we got hit with full sun and 45 degree weather for an entire week. So I'm surprised that they're doing as well as they are, but they're definitely a little sunburned and hanging in there, but a little sunburnt. We've got the dill here. Again, a little sunburnt, but it seems to be coming back strong. We've got echinacea back here, as well as in front of this valerian cluster. So it's right here and here. Echinacea is an incredibly medicinal, beautiful flower. It's a perennial as well, so hopefully it gets really well established this year and we'll have it for years to come. Right next to our kind of row here of opal basil, 
We've got our Thai basil, which fared a lot better in the heat. Still very small and baby. And then we've got our sweet basil, which is getting destroyed by ants or something. Maybe, like I mentioned before, it could be the earwigs, because they tend to just eat around the skeleton of the leaf. I'm not quite sure. It's getting some pretty bad damage, though. I've got another chamomile plant. This is the Roman annual. On this side, all of the Thai basil, as well as the opal basil that I had planted, is dead. I think it was the week of heat, <laughs> but yeah, it did not fare well on this side, which is the more acidic and more sunshiny side of this garden bed. Now on this side, we've got a lot of cilantro. Some of it bolted, but that's fine because then we get some coriander, which I did not learn was where coriander came from until this year. If you don't know, the seeds of the cilantro plant are the spice coriander. I think. If it's not coriander, it's cumin. And if I'm wrong, I'll put it on the screen. <laughs> All right. In the back here, we've got our hyssop bush on this side of the bed, noticeably smaller than the one on the other side of the bed. And then we've got our bergamot bush. The bergamot seems to be doing all right. It is a little smaller than the other side, but yeah. Same with the sage on this side of the bed. It's a little bit smaller, but does seem to be growing and is happy. So maybe the acidity just slows down the growth except for things like rosemary. The rosemary on this side of the bed is larger, is growing faster than the other side of the bed, and seems to be quite happy. I'm thinking the rosemary is gonna be a success on this side of the bed. Yeah, so that is this whole top row of this garden bed. Seems a little lackluster. They're all of the annuals that I got into the ground this year. I was a little late to getting them out. My basil is definitely hurting, but we'll see if it bounces back. Like I mentioned, this is the acidic dry side. That is the more wet shaded side down there. So I'll keep you updated on the comparison. The lower of the two herb beds is basically completely overrun with oregano. I absolutely love oregano and it's a good thing because we have about eight, nine or 10 oregano plants in this bed. And as you can tell, it's doing very, very well. It has taken over this whole bed Last year, the lemon balm was at least as tall as the oregano, and there was four plants. Now there's only two. Newly planted in this bed this year is a little chamomile plant. I literally put chamomile in every single bed. So this is a Roman chamomile, and this guy here on the end is a German chamomile. This corner gets a lot of sunshine, and you can tell that this plant was having a hard time getting established. It bolted, started producing flowers too soon, so I'm not sure if this German perennial chamomile plant is going to make it. I'm going to trim it back, water it a lot, and see if I can give it some tender love and care and bring it back, but it's looking pretty rough. I also planted some baby thyme, as well as a cosmo. On this side of the garden bed, we've got our tarragon. There's a calendula plant back there that you can't really see. It volunteered from last year, super cute. Thank you guys so much for coming along with me on my first ever garden tour. I know we went over a lot, but I got a lot of garden going on here and I am very excited to be able to share it with you. I am a little bit in awe and shock that it's all growing and it's all working and I'm going to potentially actually get to eat some of this. Back in January when I planned out the varieties and started building grow stations and buying lights and dreaming the dreams and imagining the garden layouts, it all seemed really far away. And to be able to look around and see that I've got zucchinis growing, tomatoes look happy, I've got corn, I've never grown corn before, it's working. So I'm so excited and I cannot wait to reap the benefits of the hard work, I guess. Like I mentioned earlier, I'm going to be sharing a lot of garden content coming up. I'm going to do my best to keep you guys a little bit more updated so that these don't get as long and we don't have as much to cover every time I bring you guys out to the garden. Also, that potato video, 
I am so excited to harvest potatoes. If you know me in real life or if you've ever talked to me about gardening, potatoes are like this weird love of mine and this is my first year ever growing them. So oh, if you guys want to share in my freak out excitement, <laughs> then hit that subscribe button and you will be notified when I release my potato vlog. Remember, cultivate joy and I will see you next time.